All right. Uh, hello, everyone. That looks like it's uh, has been able to join so far. I'm going to give it a couple minutes to uh, let maybe some people having some issues getting in uh, get logged on. So probably start around uh, 7:03 or so. Um, if you want uh, somewhere within, depending on the uh, type of computer you have, there should be a tab that says files. Um, and within that tab, there is a PDF version of this presentation if you want to jot any notes uh, down as we go. Um, so if you want to go ahead and get that downloaded and pulled up uh, while we wait, uh, go ahead and uh, grab that now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we will get started. Um, so for the uh, few people that just joined, um, there is a, a tab somewhere on your screen that should say files. And in there, there is a PDF version of this presentation. So if you want to jot any notes down as we go, um, I don't tend to be uh, very wordy in my in my slide. So some people might want to write notes down to say I tend to do more animation based uh, slides. So if you're one of those people, um, definitely go ahead and get one of those pulled up. Um, but thank you for uh, coming today. Um, I am Sam Stewart. I am a criticalist at the London Vet Specialists over in uh, Belsize Park. And so today we're going to talk about common toxicities that we can counter in veterinary medicine. Um, for those of you that have probably gotten the PDF pulled up already, you'll see this is a pretty long uh, presentation. I do try to get, uh, cover as many of the common toxicities as I can. So I'm going to try to get through as many as we can today. I might not get through them all, but that was a big reason I wanted you guys to have that PDF. Um, that way, if I don't get to all of them, you'll still have the information for the ones I didn't get to. Uh, but I will try my best to get through as many as possible. So uh, to start, uh, we... Um, we'll kind of go over the overview of what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to go over some reference sources that are good and helpful for you to have um, just to have on hand whenever these cases uh, present to you, something you can reference really quickly because um, there are a lot of toxins out there. It's pretty hard to memorize all of them. So it always, always, is always good to know where you can go to get resources when you need them. Uh, we're going to talk about a little about history taking. There are certain things you want to make sure you're careful about when getting those histories. Uh, decontamination uh, processes, so what do we do to actually treat these patients that have um, have been intoxicated? And then we're going to start going through the list of specific toxins and, and our most common ones. Uh, so as far as references go, uh, the quick and easy one is always uh, the one that you can call, which is going to be the Veterinary Poisons Information Center. Uh, so this is here in the UK, have their phone number listed here. Uh, they do have consultation fees, and they do vary depending on whether it's in hour or out of hours. Um, but they are very useful if you need a quick answer to talk to someone who um, can give you everything you need to know. Uh, I do believe they also have um, a membership fee that you can do if you want to avoid the uh, hospital fees, but uh, they are very useful. So definitely make sure you have their information uh, for any cases that you're not sure about. And then down here, I put a little uh, book just about uh, a quick reference toxicology. So this is just one of them. There are a couple out there. This is the one that I've used the most and I, I like the most. Um, it's really convenient. It's uh, very easy to quickly find a toxin in it. It summarizes it all really uh, concisely. Uh, so perfect thing if you just need a quick reference to, to look at. Uh, so in regards to history taking, uh, you know, we've all obviously taken probably a lot of histories before. So there are certain things that we all just know what to do. You know, we ask about the age, we get the breed, we get the weight. Um, in terms of past medical history, you know, there's definitely some things we want to make sure of, you know, dogs that maybe got into their owner's uh, heart medications. We're going to want to know if that dog itself has a previous history of, of a heart disease because that's going to change how we're going to treat those patients. So making sure we know that pest, pest history really well, but also what current medications are they on because some of the possible things that they could be um, ingesting that are intoxicating them could have uh, reactions with current medications that they're on, which means it's going to change how we would treat these patients as if it was just a sole intoxication without concurrent medications. In the history take when it comes to the actual toxin specific factors itself, time of exposure is the obvious one. How long has it been since they ingested it? That is going to affect how we choose to decontaminate these patients. What was the route of exposure? Was it oral? Was it topical? Again, that decides our decontamination process. And then what clinical signs have we started seeing yet? Sometimes that can clue us into how much has been absorbed or how uh, severely they are affected. It might tell us a little bit about prognosis so we can prep the owners on what to expect. And then also, has the owner already started any treatments at home? If they already gave that dog a lot of hydrogen peroxide orally at home, we might not want to repeat that and give even more while they're in the hospital. 
Now, when it comes to decontamination, we're going to go through and talk about each of these individually, uh, but just to review kind of the overall list, there's, you know, emesis, inducing vomiting, uh, gastric lavage, giving enemas, uh, adsorption is when we uh, have them ingest activated charcoal, uh, there's diuresis, which is the IV fluid therapy, uh, there's intralipids there, intralipid therapy, and then I don't have it listed on here, but you can also start talking about uh, hemodialysis, hemoperfusion, uh, and some of those more advanced blood purification techniques. Uh, so we'll go through each of these individually. So we'll start with emesis. And so this is going to be for toxins that were ingested typically within two to four hours of presentation, because it's usually about four hour dwell time in the stomach before most of those uh, contents have moved on to the small intestine. You're not going to get them with vomiting. Dogs that have eaten a really large sum of something, I will tend to go a little bit beyond that four hour window because there's still a chance some of that's going to be in the stomach and if I can get it out, I want to. Uh, but generally, if it gets past four hours, there's going to be a fairly limited return on, on that vomiting. And then a big thing is that you make sure these dogs have an appropriate mentation and a gag reflex. A lot of these toxins will change their mentation, will diminish their gag reflex, and those are now animals that can't protect their airway. And so if we try to induce vomiting, there's a very high chance they're going to have an aspiration pneumonia, and it's going to now compound the problems with that patient. Uh, another big contraindication with emesis is anything that's corrosive, and I don't have it listed here, but it's also anything that's sharp. And so when you always hear about what are those things that you shouldn't induce vomiting for, those are two, pat two big uh, categories, things that are sharp are going to cut on their way out, or things that are corrosive. And when you're questioning if something is corrosive, think about it on the outside of your body, and if you apply it to your arm and you imagine it's going to burn your arm, it's going to probably burn the esophagus when it comes up as well. So you think about battery acids, cleaning agents, things like that, those are the ones that you should uh, not induce vomiting. And if you really need to get them out, you should be thinking about something like gastric lavage. Now, a lot of owners are going to try to induce emesis at home, especially in the current time and day that we are right now, where we're trying to limit people coming to the hospital. So this is becoming even more prevalent than it was. Um, so hydrogen peroxide really is the big thing that most owners tend to have within their house houses already. And if they don't, it wouldn't be hard for them to get. Uh, but it would be a dose of one to five mils per keg. Um, generally start about half of that and then you can give a second dose if needed. Try not to exceed a total of 50 mils per dog. They have shown that this is just as effective as apomorphine, which we'll talk about in a second. However, it is not effective in cats, so they don't recommend using it in cats. There is the potential that you can get gastric irritation, uh, irritation from hydrogen peroxide. It's something that we don't always think about. Uh, some signs that you can see with gastric irritation is nausea and vomiting, which we were kind of trying to do anyways, so I know that was the point. Uh, but they have done a study where they did repeat endoscopies in these dogs both before and after giving hydrogen peroxide and show that these dogs did develop mucosal lesions in their stomach. Some of those mucosal lesions actually being ulcers that persisted for up to one week in some of these dogs. So giving hydrogen peroxide isn't actually technically benign. Um, it's pretty un uncommon that we'll see a major consequence, but we do have to be aware that there is some consequence to us giving it. Uh, there are some common things that people kind of know about or your kind of old techniques for inducing vomit that you might hear owners talk about that are not great ideas and should definitely recommend against them. Uh, these are things like table salts, detergents, syrup of Ipecac. Uh, these are all things that are really irritating the, to the GI tract. It's not very likely that they're going to induce emesis quite like hydrogen peroxide, so we just recommend uh, telling people to stay away from those. Now, if these are dogs that are in the hospital, um, we can always induce emesis ourselves. Uh, this is actually the video here, hopefully it's playing for everyone, um, is a dog that I saw in my internship. Uh, I worked on the uh, Jersey Shore, uh, New Jersey, US, and we just thought it was funny that this dog ate a shark that came out looking like it was swimming um, into a pool of vomit. Um, but what we did with this dog was give it apomorphine. Um, I just realized that apomorphine is misspelled in my bullet there, so please ignore it, you pretend like you don't see that. Um, and so what apomorphine does is it is a, uh, acts on the dopamine receptors in the brain. And so what that does is it's going to induce vomiting. And so this comes in both an injectable and a tablet form. Uh, I prefer the injectable just because I think it's easier. Uh, I mean, give it multiple um, uh, routes, but IV is just the easiest and the fastest. Uh, but there are also the six milligram tablets, which you put in the conjunctival sac uh, in the corner of the eye. Uh, once vomiting starts, you just flush it out and get the excess out. Um, for the injectable version, your dose is going to be 0 0.02, uh, 0 uh, 0.02 to 0 0.04 uh, milligrams per kilogram, and so that would probably be a little bit on the higher end for the non-IV doses. There could be some side effects with apomorphine, uh, one being sedation, which is not super common, but if you ever have one that's pretty significant, it is an opioid family drug, so you can reverse that sedation with naloxone. Um, and then you can also see prolonged vomiting, which you'd give antimedics for, like Serenia or Ondansetron. 
Now, in term of in terms of emesis for cats, uh, a lot of you probably know apomorphine is not very effective in cats, and so it's just pretty much contraindicated. We know it just doesn't work, um, and so what we do instead is use dexmedetomidine. And studies with dexmedetomidine have shown that it's got about an 80% efficacy at getting cats to vomit. That vomiting episode can be pretty delayed, as much as 12 minutes, so it's not necessarily immediate. Um, in terms of doses, uh, main range is going to be 1 to 10 uh, micrograms per kilogram IV. Um, I usually tend to start again at a slightly lower dose and then I'll go up if I need to, knowing that as you get into those higher doses, you're going to probably start seeing some uh, sedation happening. Uh, median in, in a lot of studies was uh, 0.7, or sorry, uh, 7 micrograms per kilogram. Uh, if you do get sedation, you can reverse with adipamazole. Uh, I tend to not have quite 80% luck with this. My, I, I feel like I tend to be more around 50 to 60%. Um, so what I like to do is I like to give it in combination with hydromorphone. Uh, a lot of us know that hydromorphone causes some pretty significant uh, nausea, and I find that the two of these together tends to be really effective. Um, so I'll give uh, uh, 0.05 milligrams per kilogram IV of that. And again, if you get too much sedation, you can always reverse it with naloxone. Uh, and the thing that I like to do, which uh, is a little bit unique and some people think is a little mean, is that I will put these cats in their carrier and then I will put those uh, carriers on a rotating chair and I will do a slow spin in them to try to induce some vestibular nausea. Um, and so this cat here is pretty much doing it itself, but normally I would have them in a carrier and I would spin the carrier on the chair. And I tend to find with these three things together, I get maybe now closer to 80 to 90% efficacy uh, with vomiting. So some few tricks to try. Uh, like I said earlier, if these uh, patients are not uh, very uh, appropriately mentation-wise, and if they potentially don't have a good gag reflex, then gastric lavage is the way you should go. Um, and so these patients should be fully anesthetized, even if they are somewhat uh, obtunded from their uh, intoxication. If they're not fully anesthetized, you should fully anesthetize them. You're going to measure your tube to the last rib. So kind of like in this picture here, you can see they're bringing that to the last rib. And then you mark the spot here at the snout uh, where you're ending. Lubricate that tube very well. Pass it down um, into uh, the stomach through the esophagus. The nice thing about these dogs being under full anesthesia is you have them intubated. So that tube, uh, the stomach tube should go straight down the esophagus and into the stomach. Uh, don't use a ton of force. If it's not going, gently twist and use some uh, forward and backward motion. Don't try to force it. Um, and then at this point, you're going to instill some fluid. And so you can either do this by gravity, where you hold it above the patient and let it passively flow in, or you can use uh, an actual pump. You just need to be very careful that you're being you're aware of how much you're putting in. Stomach volume is about 10 to 20 mils per keg. So just make sure you're not putting in a massive amount over that. Otherwise, you're going to be over distending that stomach. But once you get that fluid in, let it dwell for a few seconds. Sometimes I'll give it a little jiggle. And then drop that to below the level of the patient, let everything passively flow out, and then you repeat that back and forth as many times as you need until you feel like you've gotten enough out and you're seeing clear water come back out of that patient. And this fluid here that you're using to flush with is just regular tap water. Just make sure you're warming it up about to a patient, patient uh, temperature so that way you're not inducing any massive changes to their body temperature. And then a big one that a lot of people forget about is always make sure you kink this tube when you're pulling it out. There is going to still be some stomach contents in that tube when you pull it out. If you don't have it kinked, it will leak on its way out and you could potentially leak it uh, into the airway. So make sure you have that tube kinked. Um, enemas is another one. It's not quite as common for us to do, but it is effective um, when you are late in exposure um, or you have uh, toxins that are enterohepatically recirculated. And those enterohepatically recirculated drugs are uh, referring to specifically this part right here, which is if you remember um, about bile, is that bile goes through your GI tract and 95% of that bile gets reabsorbed and brought back to the stomach, or sorry, to the liver for recirculation. And so that uh, bile that goes back to the liver, if you're having a intoxication that can bind to, to bile salts or to other components in bile, you'll see it get recirculated and it will continue to pass back and forth. So sometimes you can give enemas either with lactulose um, or just a regular enema without anything added into it. And you might be able to grab some of those bile salts that have um, a toxin bound to them and then have them excreted naturally. Uh, adsorption, so like I said before, this is going to be referring to activated charcoal. Um, if this video is playing for you, you know, this is the nice patient that just wants to eat it. Um, I can't imagine what drives a dog to eat this, but also what drives a dog to eat most of the things they eat. But this is the dream case. Um, otherwise, we're usually having to syringe it into them. 
um, but activated charcoal creates a really high surface area. So charcoal is very porous. It's got a large surface area and it likes to bind things. And so it's able to bind a high quantity of a toxin when it's administered and is in a time period that there's still a lot of that toxin in the stomach. Uh, some of these um, charcoals will contain something called sorbitol. Um, sorbitol is a very basic sugar. It acts as a cathartic, which means it pulls water into the GI tract towards it. So it essentially makes the GI tract have a little bit more water content and it speeds that transit time up and gets it out faster. So it just decreases the amount that can absorb in that time period. Um, so you can see some of these activated charcoals both with and without sorbitol. There are some contraindications to giving it. Uh, obvious one that we've already talked about is decreased mentation or absence of a gag. Uh, if there's been a pretty prolonged duration since ingestion, it's probably not going to be as, as effective unless that is a dog or a toxin that has enterohepatic recirculation, then it might make sense to do uh, additional doses because we know that toxin is going to be going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, there are some toxins that just don't bind to charcoal, so a lot of times people just don't give them. It doesn't hurt, so a lot of people still do. There's nothing wrong with that, but we just know it won't be very effective. And then also severe dehydration, and this in particular is important for the charcoals that contain sorbitol, because like I said, that sorbitol is going to pull water into the GI tract and will be defecated out. So that patient is already dehydrated. You're now about to contribute to that dehydration by making them lose that fluid. So if you do, if you feel like it's very important that you give that sorbitol in a dehydrated patient, make sure you're giving them a good clip of um, IV fluids as well to compensate. And then the same thing, don't give repeat doses of sorbitol. It's, that's a one-time thing. If you think you need more doses of, of activated charcoal, give the charcoal that does not have sorbitol, because the more and more sorb sorbitol you get, the more and more uh, water loss you have, and the more likely you're going to have uh, dangerous hypernatremia uh, develop. So just be cautious with that. Um, I didn't put a dose in here, uh, but dose tends to be one to, mil, uh, one to five uh, mils per kilogram of uh, body weight. Uh, diuresis, this is a pretty easy one. Um, I think it's a, a pretty well-known thing that, you know, flush an animal with a high rate of IV fluids, you can help flush out a lot of these toxins. I think it's the most obvious of our treatments. Um, in terms of how high rate how high of a rate I give, I go as anywhere from one to three times a maintenance rate, with a maintenance rate being defined as two to 2.5 mils per kg per hour. Uh, a big thing that's going to define that rate is age of the patient, I'm going to push harder and younger, less hard and older. And also if they have any pre-existing cardiac disease, obviously a cardiac patient, less hard, uh, no cardiac disease, I will push them harder. If you have a patient with some sort of pre-existing disease that's really going to make it difficult to push them hard, what you can always do is place a urinary catheter, measure the fluid that goes in, measure the fluid that goes out. You can have a little bit of a better idea if you're pushing them too hard because you'll know if you're getting it all out or not. And so that's the way to help monitor that if you really think you need to push them harder than, than they might be able to tolerate. Uh, intralipid therapy, this one's pretty cool. It's uh, fairly new on the scene of toxin treatment and is gaining a lot of ground. Um, so this is an, uh, an antidote for anything that is a fat-soluble toxin, and I will tell you in a minute how to know if a, if a toxin is fat-soluble. But essentially what this stuff is is a 20% uh, mixture of intralipid, which is essentially an oil emulsion made from soybeans. Um, it's really nice because it has a long shelf life. Uh, you do have to be pretty careful with aseptic technique because as you can imagine, this is a nice medium for bacterial growth. So I have to be very careful with that. Um, when you first use it, refrigerate it immediately and throw it out after 24 hours. Otherwise, you're going to start growing some stuff. Um, but it is very convenient because you can give it through a peripheral catheter. And prior to this, a lot of our fat emulsions that we gave IV were things for um, intravenous nutrition. Um, and so those ones had to be given through central catheters. And so this now is peripheral, which just makes it a lot easier. Uh, the mechanism of how it works is not fully understood. We think it has something to do with uh, a theory that we call the lipid sink. Um, and so I will describe this on the next slide, so we will come back to that. Uh, there are a couple of other nice benefits that come along with it that they have shown it does improve cardiac performance a little bit and that it might help replenish some mitochondria and some ATP um, generation ability in some cells. So just some added uh, nice things. And it's not, of course, risk-free. Uh, you do have a chance of causing some pancreatitis because you are putting a large volume of fat into the circulatory system. Uh, you can have some of that fat embolize, and so you do have to give this through a filter to make sure you don't have any big chunks of fat that could accidentally get administered. Uh, very similar to other types of kinds of transfusions, you can get uh, respiratory reactions to this. Uh, not very common, I've never seen it, but uh, low rate of uh, patients it can happen. Uh, patients that have heart disease, you can certainly fluid overload with this. It, uh, it, it is a large volume and it uh, will take up a lot of space. And then also it can get bacterially contaminated and could cause sepsis if you gave that IV. 
So now in terms of how the lipid uh, theory works, um, here on the left, I have a blood vessel. Um, and over here on the right, I have a brain. And hopefully the animation is working for everyone. So you can see the little red blood cells uh, flowing through our blood vessel here. And so what happens in a toxicated patient is we're going to take over here in the brain, we're going to put these T toxins in the brain that we now need to get out. Um, we know that this toxin is very lipid soluble. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get intralipid, which is going to look like this. And if you remember, your lipids look like a little hydrophilic head with these little hydrophobic little tails. And so when you give all these lipids, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to join together and they're going to want to make what's going to look like a little cell. And so remember, this is two dimensional in real life. This would be three dimensional. And this is almost an actual full lipid bilayer. It makes a true looking little cell. That's a full three dimensional cell. And so what happens is you've now created a space inside of this cell that is separate from the blood and is separate from this brain tissue or the interstitial uh, tissue in the brain. And so now it means you have the ability to create a concentration gradient where we have a high concentration of toxin here not very much in the blood and not very much in this little cell that we've created. And it's going to make those toxins want to go into that little bubble that we made. And once that happens, that bubble then gets removed from circulation and that toxin is now out. And so there are several uh, really well-known intralipid things that are uh, toxins that respond very well to intralipid. The really big one that has uh, been known the longest are pyrethrins. I list a few other ones here. Um, don't bother trying to like memorize this list. There's a much easier way to know how to do this. These are just the common ones. I'll tell you how to look up which toxins are appropriate in just a second. Um, I just wanted to show this really cool video here at the top. Uh, this is a pyrethrin cat. So uh, for those that aren't um, as familiar with pyrethrin or permethrin uh, toxicities, um, they affect nerve transduction and uh, uh, cause uh, tremors like we were just seeing in that cat. Uh, this here is the intralipid that they're about to give. So, so you can see it literally looks like a bag of milk. And now you can see the cat on a syringe pump uh, getting that intralipid. Uh, pyrethrin is the really nice one because you see a really fast response. And literally in just a few hours in this cat here, we can now see this cat is up. Uh, the tremors have resolved and it's eating. Um, so it's a really um, rewarding uh, treatment to do because um, you can see it really quickly. So in terms of when to know to do intralipid theory and how to know it's going to work is you have to find out that fat solubility of the toxin. And so this is reported with something called log P. And so if the toxin has a log P that is greater to one. It means it is amendable to, lipid, to intralipid therapy. And so I listed out some just random drugs here. They're sort of random log P's. It just so happens here at the bottom they had permethrin. And you can see that is definitely much above one. And that's why permethrin responds so well to intralipid. And this is really easy to find out. Literally just go onto Google, type in a name of a toxin, and type in log P. And I guarantee you'll find some website somewhere that lists out the chemical uh, properties of that uh, drug or that compound. And it'll have the log P on there. It takes five seconds. Um, and it's really easy. And so whether you have lintralipid or not, you can always look this up. And if you have it, you give it. And if you don't, you can tell that patient or that owner, I know your dog would respond really well to intralipid therapy. And I know this hospital over here has it. So I think you should go there and, and get this. Uh, so when, when you're giving it, um, it is a little bit of a weird protocol that it's given over. Um, but, and it varies a little bit, but this is the most common where you give an initial bolus of 1.5 mils per kg just over a quick minute, and then you actually give 0.25 uh, mils per kg per minute uh, for 30 to 60 minutes. And like I said before, give that through a filter so we don't cause any fat emboli. Uh, some patients we will redose, especially the patients that continue to be affected after, you know, we, we'll give it a few hours. Um, so I said right here, four to six hours, we'll give it. And if they're still affected, we'll consider another dose. Um, in really severe cases, we'll consider a CRI. Um, not very common, but we will. Um, but the important thing is always check a PCV total solids before you redose, not because you're actually checking the PCV total solids, but we're, we're trying to see how lipemic that sample is. If that serum is really lipemic, it's probably not a great idea to give another dose because now we're just asking for pancreatitis to develop. Um, so always check that first, only give if it looks like that serum has started to clear and it's not totally opaque. All right. That was our review of, um, of decontaminants. Like I said, the one that we really didn't cover is uh, hemodialysis and hemoperfusion, but that's sort of a whole nother level of, um, of a talk. So we'll, we'll cover that another day. But for now, we're gonna move on to our toxins. Um, so I'm gonna start here with our food group. I think these are the ones that people are the most familiar with. So I might uh, try to just get through these ones real quick. Uh, so we'll talk about chocolate first. Big uh, toxic component in chocolate is going to be our methylxanthines, theobromine being the main one, but caffeine is in there too. 
the toxic effect is that it's going to increase circulating catecholamines. So these are like your sympathetic hormones, epinephrine, uh, things that are going to really get you into that fight or flight response. Um, and it's also going to cause increased calcium entry uh, into cells, which is going to cause a lot of muscular contractility. And this is both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. And then in terms of organs affected, cardiac, like I already said, we can see some CNS at really high doses, and this is going to be a lot to do this calcium entry, as well as uh, something called catecholamine toxicity that can happen in nervous tissue, and then some obvious GI discomfort, uh, gastroenterocolitis. Um, I wrote some toxic doses of theobromine and what that toxic potential is and the signs. Um, I included the kind of average uh, uh, concentrations of theobromine in our uh, chocolate uh, things here. Uh, there are some uh, little chocolate wheels or things like here that you can get for free from a lot of places that you can kind of spin it to the dog's weight and, uh, and see if the dog ate a toxic dose. If you don't have these, they're really nice. I recommend them. Otherwise, you can use this table uh, and do the math yourself. And then in terms of treatment, uh, obviously make them vomit if it's in a reasonable amount of time and give them some charcoal. Uh, fluid diuresis for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, 24 is usually sufficient, 48 for really severe cases. Um, generally that peak is reached in, in 10 hours, uh, and so 24 should be plenty of time to get it out of their system. Uh, really important to have these dogs on continuous ECG monitoring. Uh, they will develop tachycardia if they ate a sufficient amount. And if that tachycardia or they start progressing from tachycardia into more serious arrhythmias, uh, we definitely need to know to treat those and to treat those pretty quickly. Uh, so propanolol is the first line agent to treat those tachycardias. Most often it's going to be a sinus tachycardia, but you can start seeing it progressing into uh, ventricular tachycardia. In the latter, you might need to go to lidocaine. Not very common though. You usually can get away with just propanolol. Um, but the time to start pulling the trigger for this is generally when you start hitting 160 into 170, I'm getting it drawn up in the in the syringe and, and questioning it. And when you start getting 170 to 180, it's really time to pull the trigger uh, and give that drug and get that heart rate down. Uh, some of these dogs will be very agitated and excited, so sedate them as you need, acepromazine or butorphanol. Um, again, pick the one that seems the most appropriate for that patient. If they have heart disease, ACE is probably not the best uh, choice, so use butorphanol. And then, like I said, really severe ones, you can see CNS signs like seizures and so Valium to treat those if they arise. And then in terms of prognosis, it's generally really good. It's very rare. You tend to see a toxic uh, chocolate case. It can happen, especially for the dogs that have severe arrhythmias or CNS involvement. Um, but also just make sure, don't forget, just because you get the, the acute phases, it doesn't mean that in the days after you can't see a delayed reaction like pancreatitis or a really bad gastroenterocolitis. So just make sure you prep owners for that potential because it could happen. And then this is a really disgusting picture of a chocolate toxicity dog vo uh, vomiting, but it's also just really impressive and I just like to show it. Uh, next, we're going to talk about grapes and raisins. Um, so it's easy to talk about the toxic component for these because we don't know what it is. Um, it does not appear to be dose dependent, um, so it does not matter how much they eat. One grape or one raisin can be enough. Uh, the reason that it, it's toxic, I said, we also don't know. Um, we do believe it's an idiosyncratic reaction, and so that means it's some sort of autoimmune reaction where they react to some sort of compound in the grape or the raisin that sets off this reaction. Again, that's a hypothesis. We don't know. Uh, but ultimately, what we do know is that whatever happens, it results in renal ischemia, so reduced blood flow to that kidney, uh, and we get uh, really bad then kidney damage from that, sometimes kidney failure. And so like right here, organs affected uh, tends to be the kidneys. Uh, the clinical signs initially are none. Um, they tend to develop about 24 to 48 hours after, and they tend to be really vague symptoms, you know, renal failure symptoms, vomiting, lethargy, and apodence. So nothing um, pathognomonic, but uh, kind of what you'd expect for, for a renal failure patient. Um, treatment, uh, time to treatment is a big factor. Um, so some people say, oh, I'll wait and see if signs develop. Uh, that's a bad idea. These patients should always come in right away. It should be considered to treat in all exposed patients. Like I said, it's idiosyncratic. It's not all patients that are going to get um, get a toxic effect. Uh, some dogs eat grapes all the time and they're totally fine, but we have no idea of knowing which ones are which. Um, so we have to recommend it for all of them. Um, if it's within a reasonable amount of time, induce some assist, give them some activated charcoal, and then give them some IV fluid diuresis. We know that those compounds from those grapes stay around for at least 24, or sorry, 70, 48 to 72 hours. So really they should be on, on IV fluids somewhere within that amount of time. Uh, owners that really can't all reduce it down to 24 and say it's better than nothing, but I, I really try to stress the two to three days. And then really importantly, watch that urine output. Um, it's not require that you need to have a urine catheter in place, but make sure that you see at least some degree of uh, reliable urine. It should be at least, you know, 0.5 
mils per keg uh, per hour at minimum. Ideally, should be one mil per keg per hour. Um, but if you don't feel like you're seeing that just visually without measuring it, that patient should definitely have a urinary catheter, and you should be watching that more closely. Uh, watch those kidney values at least every 24 hours. Some people do at Q12. I personally don't feel like the renal values change that quickly Q12 hours unless there's something really severe going on. So use your best judgment on that, but they should be checked for at least 72 hours or longer if they developed an elevation within that time period. And then if they start developing a worsening azotemia or you think they start they starting to become oliguric or anuric, those are really concerning and starts uh, raising red flags for a poor prognosis. And I say referral should be considered because these patients are looking at dialysis. Um, so uh, definitely get them somewhere that has that. Uh, prognosis in general, thankfully, is really good because um, most dogs tend to not develop the idiosyncratic reaction. It is guarded in the ones that do develop to do up the reaction, especially those that start becoming um, azotemic or anuric oliguric, uh, tends to be pretty poor. Um, onions and garlic, not a super, super common one, but we do see it sometimes. Um, there is something called organosulfoxides in the onions and garlic that cause them to be toxic. And what happens is when you chew those, you break them down into uh, a smaller mixture of sulfur compounds. And those sulfur compounds bind to iron and hemoglobin and oxidize it. And what that does is it causes Heinz body formation and also something called methemoglobinemia, uh, methemoglobin being the um, uh, uh, a hemoglobin with an oxidized iron uh, bound to it uh, tends to make a very brown colored blood. Uh, so of the organs affected, it's the red blood cells. More, most significant what happens is those red blood cells, when they become oxidized, get uh, targeted for destruction, and you will get intravascular hemolysis and potentially severe anemia. Um, and so this is a picture of some pretty classic looking Heinz bodies, so the little purple uh, dots that are concentrated in these. And then this is uh, what's called a, a paper towel test. It's, it's very uh, sophisticated. Uh, this is how you diagnose uh, methemoglobinemia. And what you do is you put a drop of blood for, from a known uh, normal healthy patient on a piece of paper towel. And then you put a drop of blood from a patient that you think might be methemoglobinemic. And if you compare the two, and this one looks brown, you can diagnose them with methemoglobinemia. Uh, there are a couple more official ways to do it. Um, some people have... Um, blood gas machines in their hospital that can measure met hemoglobinemia, or some people might have a co-oximeters, which is a, a more advanced version of like a pulse ox that can measure it. Um, but this is sort of the quick and dirty way for, because a lot of people that you know, most hospitals don't have that. So this is the other way to do it. Um, there is a toxic dose. I, you know, how, how would you ever know what the concentration of, of these sulfoxide uh, compounds are in, in garlic and onion? So this is not very helpful, but there is a dose that's known. Um, you will tend to see more GI symptoms with these, which are manageable and not a big deal. Um, but for the patients that tend to eat a lot, and it does usually have to be like raw garlic, raw onion, because if they're cooked, it's a little bit lower. So they have to eat a lot of this. Um, but you will start seeing signs of anemia if you're getting really bad oxidation of the red blood cells. So look for signs of anemia, dyspnea, tachycardia, pale vicus membranes, um, obvious stuff like that. In terms of treatment, uh, vomiting, charcoal, things that we already know if it's early enough. Blood transfusion, if they've actually developed a significant enough anemia. Um, there isn't really anything you can do per se for the um, Heinz body anemia. Um, if there's a really bad met hemoglobinemia, you can treat that. It's not recommended unless it's severe. Um, there's something called methylene blue that you would give for that. I actually talk about it a little bit later in this presentation, so it'll probably come up a little bit later. Um, it's unlikely you'll have to do that, but it is there uh, if you need it. Um, and then supportive care for these animals, which usually is uh, you know, GI treatments. Um, and prognosis tends to be great. There's, it's very rare you ever see a uh, garlic or onion toxicity. Um, xylitol, now this is a big one. We see quite a lot of this. It's really common and it is quite dangerous. Um, so this is a really important one to know. Um, so we know about it from sugar-free gum. However, they are starting to put it in way more foods than they used to. I've seen it in peanut butter and all sorts of crazy things. And because it's new in those things, people don't know it's there. And so there's starting to be a lot of accidental xylitol ingestions, even in people that know it's toxic. Um, I put oral care, product, oral care products here also because that's another big one that you'll tend to see. And so if a dog eats a, you know, a tube of toothpaste or something, make sure you check if uh, there isn't xylitol in it. Um, toxic effects. Uh, the body recognizes the xylitol as a sugar source, and so it reacts assumptively appropriately by releasing a bunch of insulin. However, xylitol is in glucose, and it's not going to act like glucose. And so all that insulin that just got released is going to uptake glucose. 
it's not going to uptake all that xylitol, so it's uptaking glucose that wasn't there was no meal associated with this other than other than the xylitol. So there was no glucose to be taken up by that insulin, and so you induce a really severe hypoglycemia. And this tends to be onset very quickly, within sometimes as short as 20 to 30 minutes, and that tends to be the big um, clinical sign that that makes people realize something happened. Um, in addition to that, xylitol is also a liver toxin, and so in its own form, it's not toxic, but the liver does metabolize it in, in that process of metabolizing it. It depletes its ATP. It generates reactive oxygen species, and those can cause really bad hepatic necrosis and progressive hepatic failure. Tends to be um, what is the more um, fatal part of this ingestion. A toxic dose for hypoglycemia, it is very low. It doesn't take very much. Um, so if a dog ate it, it's recommended to uh, start performing decontamination, regardless of how much you think they ate. Liver failure, it's a little bit of a higher dose, but also still not that high. You can see there have been reports of it being pretty low. Um, so even if you don't think it's a lot, still use caution. Um, clinical signs, hypoglycemic clinical signs, I think everyone's probably fairly, pretty familiar with those, you know, ataxia, tremoring, collapse, seizures. Liver failure, these do take days to develop, so you're not going to see them right away, so make sure owners are aware of that. But these are going to be things like icterus, uh, bruising if you start getting um, loss of um, uh, clotting factor production, and then some signs of bleeding like melana and altered mentation. Treatment, vomiting, again, it's going to be the thing we're going to say for all of these. Uh, xylitol is one of those things that doesn't bind very well to charcoal. Most people tend to give it anyways because there's not really a huge negative consequence to doing it, um, so it's totally up to you. Uh, IV fluid diuresis, I typically do it for at least at least 24 hours, but really the patient's going to tell you on how long they need to be on it for, and they're going to be directing you by how hypoglycemic or how bad of a liver reaction they're having. Early stages, monitor that BG, that blood glu glucose, very frequently, every two to four hours, and then space it out as you can see that they are maintaining okay. And then monitor their liver enzymes every 24 hours. Um, if you don't see any liver ele elevations within the first, I would say, three, maybe four days, then you're good. You don't have to worry about it. Um, if you do develop elevations, you don't need to continue to monitor them 24 hours every single day until they go back to normal. Just monitor them every 24 to 48 hours until you see them plateau, and then start spacing it out every week, every month, whatever seems appropriate, and we monitor them until they go back down to normal. Um, liver protectants are also obviously really important in these dogs. N-acetylcysteine, if you have it, um, it's great. You can give it IV, it acts a lot faster, and, and you can give it a higher concentration. Um, there's a, I, I wrote the dose later in this presentation, but it's an initial dose of 140 milligrams per kilogram, one-time dose followed by a 70 milligram per kilogram dose Q6 hours for at least seven doses. Like I said, I wrote it later. So if you have it, this is ideal to be given. If you don't have it, give something orally, um, Denisil, Marin, and Denimarin. I will apologize, I'm from the US and I moved here recently, so I, I, these might have different names here in the UK, uh, but these are um, S-adenosyl, methionine, and, um, and uh, um, Marin is uh, milk thistle extract, um, so a pretty common um, uh, for liver protections to be used. Um, usually these patients are hospitalized for 24 to 48 hours. Again, it's going to be longer depending on how their symptoms are in hypoglycemia and uh, liver damage. If they are to develop liver failure, and you will know because you will start seeing those liver values, specifically ALT, start going really high, you will start seeing them becoming hypocoagulable. Um, if you don't have the ability to measure PT and PTT in your hospital to watch for this and you think they are at risk of this, uh, refer them somewhere where this can be watched because this is very serious. Um, if they develop this, they're going to need plasma transfusion, specifically fresh frozen plasma to replace the clotting factors that aren't getting made by the liver, which is causing this. Um, they might need a red blood, uh, red blood cell transfusion if they have um, lost blood from this. And I guess one important thing I should add, um, hypocoagulopathies like this, secondary to an insult to the liver, whether this be toxin related or not, it's not necessarily recommended to give one of these plasma transfusions unless you start seeing side effects of this. So if, unless you start seeing bruising, petechiations, you know, bleeding somewhere in the body, I don't tend to pull the trigger for this. If I see it, obviously pull the trigger, um, but sometimes the risks of this outweigh the benefits. So if they don't need it immediately, maybe we shouldn't take the risk of the potential complications that could come with that. Now, the double whammy that's really nice is if these patients are also hypotensive and you need to give them some colloids and you maybe don't want to reach for head of starch or vet starch because of the potential issues that have been reported in, in the literature. 
plasma is a really nice replacement colloid. It works maybe not quite as well with head of starch, but it does help a little bit. So it's got that be that added benefit. Um, with, like I said, this being due to the, the hypocoagulopathy being due to a um, loss of clotting factors, we do know that those clotting factors need vitamin K to become active. Um, so what we can do is we can supplement vitamin K because there might still be some left over. We maybe didn't bleed all of them. And so the few that's left of clotting factors, let's give it as much vitamin K as we can um, to supplement them. And so if you're going to give this injectably, we recommend giving it sub-Q and avoiding like IM injections because an IM injection in a hypocoagulable patient isn't the greatest because you can cause uh, bleed. Um, some of these patients that are persistently hypotensive in the face of fluids, we might need to do some vasopressors, and then really severe cases, we might need to be mechanically ventilating uh, these patients. Um, prognosis in general is actually pretty excellent, even if they develop hypoglycemia or mild liver value elevations. Um, but dogs that, that start developing significant hepatic dysfunction, prognosis is definitely much more guarded to port for those guys, unfortunately. All right, uh, we are now going to move down into our rodenticides. Uh, and so specifically, we're going to go over four different ones, starting with anticoagulants, followed by bromethylene, cholecalciferol, and zinc phosphide. And so like I said, we'll start with anticoagulants. And specifically, these are going to work through vitamin K inhibition. And so one really annoying thing about anticoagulants is that there are a ton out there. And a lot of them are names that we're maybe not familiar with. And so owners come in sometimes with these brands that we've never heard of before with drug names that we don't know what they are. But the one nice thing is that the majority of them are, uh, are anticoagulant rodenticides, which means they can all be treated the same and they all have the same mode of action. So just find the name, look it up and find, you know, confirm if it is uh, anticoagulant or one of these other ones that we're going to talk about. And chances are it's most likely going to be anticoagulant and you're going to follow what we're about to talk about now. Now, in terms of the toxic effect of rodenticides, like I said, it has to do with vitamin K. And vitamin K itself, in its parent form, um, is inactive. Your body can't use it uh, for activation of your clotting factors. And so what happens is your body converts it into uh, its active form with something called a reductase. And then that active form will take your um, coagulation factors and will turn them into an active form. However, in doing that, you do now create an inactive form of vitamin K, and that inactive form now has to be made active again, which is done by something called uh, vitamin K epoxide reductase. Now, what these rodenticides do is they inhibit specifically that vitamin K epoxide reductase, which means that once that vitamin K gets used, we can't recycle um, it back around, and so it gets depleted, and we now don't have it available to activate our clotting factors. Now, in terms of clinical signs, often you won't see any initially because they're not going to be there uh, because it's going to be more so uh, coagulopathy stuff, which will take a day or two to develop. Um, hopefully, most owners have recognized before this point and they came in for treatment, which is the ideal situation because once uh, symptoms start developing, it's not as easy to treat. Um, so hopefully we don't get to that point. But you can see typical things that you expect with bleeding. So where it's coming from, hem uh, hematemesis, epistaxis, bruising, and then signs of anemia pale because membrane's weakness. Um, one big thing that I always like to point out, it's unlikely to see this with an ingestion of a poison rodent. I know that's a big thing that sometimes people uh, call about with their dog ate, or ate a mouse. Uh, do they need to be worried? Um, dogs need to eat quite a lot of poison rodents, as much as a pound of dead rodents per kilogram of dog. Um, so I made a little animation here of what that would probably look like, but regardless, it would be a lot. Um, so it's pretty unlikely that they would be able to eat enough of this. Cats could maybe get a little bit closer, but even in cats, it's pretty unlikely. Um, so unless um, it's just known that that rat ate a large quantity um, because they saw its, uh, you know, its abdomen ripped open and a lot of um, poison leaking out that they then witnessed the animal eat, um, it's pretty unlikely they ingest enough to be toxic. Um, so in terms of diagnosing anticoagulant uh, rodenticides, um, like I said, PT and PTT are going to be your easiest uh, ones to do that. So your PT will become ele uh, elevated first or become prolonged first. Um, and that PTT may or may not become elevated at all. And the reason for that being is that we have our vitamin K dependent factors. And so again, these are the ones that are going to be uh, affected by, by the rodenticides. We have our intrinsic pathway of clotting and our ex or, or sorry, extrinsic pathway of clotting and our intrinsic. So this is going to give everyone shudders of veterinary school all over again. Um, but PT measures our in extrinsic pathway. PTT measures intrinsic. And as you can see, most of our um, vitamin K dependent factors are extrinsic or this common pathway. And, and these are the ones that are measured by PT, which is why they become ele elevated first. Only factor nine here in the intrinsic is affected. And 
it that it because it's only that one that's why you may or may not see ptt become elevated now after these we do have a couple tests to actually diagnose the rodenticides themselves and so there's the pivka test or there's mass uh, mass spect uh, spectroscopy or liquid chromatography um, you can only generally only find these in university uh, diagnostic labs or specialty labs uh, so it's really hard it's some it's generally not expensive but they have really long turnaround time so if you have a poison patient with you right now it's really not helpful um, if you want to confirm it later by all means you should submit it to confirm it but for an acute diagnosis you're not going to get it from there um, and then PCV, hematocrit, uh, this is mostly to make sure you don't need a blood transfusion. So watching that closely to, to know when to pull that trigger. And then not only making that call for a transfusion just off the PCV alone, but the uh, symptoms that patient is having, tachycardia, you know, dyspnea, weakness, things like that. Uh, when it comes to treatment, like I said, our repeating theme, emesis and activated charcoal. Um, the really nice thing to treat rodenticides is it's not super hard. We just got to supplement them with vitamin K. It, it's not, you know, it's going to go inactive. It's going to become inactivated and it won't become active again. But that's why we're going to continue to administer it for 30 days. And usually within 30 days, all of the rat poison should be out of their body that you can then stop giving vitamin K and everything goes back to normal. Um, if these patients are coagulopathic, they are going to need, like I said before, fresh frozen plasma transfusions in order to replace their clotting factors and then packed red blood cells if they are anemic. Um, if they are coagulopathic, they should be in the hospital receiving these things and stay in the hospital until they become non-coagulopathic, like the picture down here, um, because they need to be monitored very closely for hemorrhage. Um, after the 30 days of being on this vitamin K, um, you'll be rechecking their PT, PTT. And if it is still prolonged, you're going to then continue it for another week. And so that's how you'll know when to stop it, is you're going to give it for 30 days, give them a window of two or three days without it, check coags, if they're prolonged, start it again for a week, check again, and you'll go back and forth until you see it's normal. Generally, after the 30 days, you're fine. It's pretty uncommon you have to give a prolonged dose, but still you need to check. Uh, next, we will move into bromethylene. So bromethylene is an awful one. Um, it works in the central nervous system. Specifically, what it does is it affects um, these sodium potassium ATPase pumps. And so the way these work is that we have um, ATP that's going to come from our mitochondria, are going to activate those pumps and they're going to put sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. And so that's in order for normal, we need that for normal cell function. It's very important. Um, what bromethylene is going to do is it's going to inhibit that ability to produce ATP, which means we can't use this pump. And what happens over time is that sodium is going to build up in that cell. And what goes with sodium is water. So water is going to build up with that sodium and it's going to distend that cell. And what's going to happen is that over time, those cells are going to rupture and lice, and we're now going to have tissue damage um, because we're now losing cells. And this is, don't forget, this is happening in the brain and central nervous system tissue. So it's a, it's a really horrible toxin, uh, to say the least. Clinical signs are all going to be neuro-related, ataxia, CPD deficits, tremors, altered mentation seizures. Um, you can see um, even paresis and paralysis with low doses. Um, there are no very easy tests available. Again, it's going to be university uh, or specialty labs with um, mass spec or chromatography. Um, not going to be fast enough to get you a diagnosis, though. Um, so you usually have to just know if they ingested it. Um, to treat vomiting charcoal, uh, fluids, and then potentially, uh, depending on how severe, um, anticonvulsants and ventilation. If you can decontaminate them early, you can get a good prognosis. If they start becoming symptomatic, it's generally not great. Um, a lot of those neuroscience tend to be permanent. And once they start, they tend to continue to progress regardless of treatment. Um, so you really want to try to get these guys treated as early as possible. Uh, next is cholecalciferol. Um, so this one is essentially vitamin D3. It's absorbed very rapidly from the GI tract, and it is then very also rapidly converted to its toxic form. Um, what it does is it causes significant hypercalcemia, and it generally takes a day or two, um, but it does it by increasing absorption of calcium from the GI tract, from the bone, and decreasing excretion to the urine. And so what happens is, as you can see in these kidneys here on the right, it's going to cause really bad mineralization of the kidneys. And so what that's going to happen is cause some uh, renal dysfunction, and you're going to see signs like lethargy, vomiting, um, anorexia, fairly, you know, vague symptoms. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, generally blood work changes are going to be your hallmarks. Again, definitive treatments, going uh, definitive diagnosis, you're going to need a university or a specialty lab, um, but you will see hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, 
on your blood work. And then as those kidneys start really getting damaged, some azotemia, uh, and then potentially a low parathyroid hormone because we've got the pronounced uh, hypercalcemia and um, the vitamin D present. Uh, in terms of treatment, vomiting and charcoal, um, fluids, but making sure those fluids are low in calcium. So you can always check on the front of the fluid bags how much calcium is in them. And generally most of them are, are pretty low, but always double check. Um, trying to reduce that calcium. And so this is something called calciuresis, which is what you're seeing here in these kidneys. And so there's two ways to do that, which is giving furosemide and prednisone. Monitoring the ionized calcium at least every uh, 24 hours. And do note this is ionized calcium, not total. Um, you really want to uh, measure the ionized because that's what is going to be the most accurate. And then to remember, these patients do have a guard prognosis cut because these kidneys do take a pretty significant hit when this happens, um, and it's uh, generally pretty significant. Uh, last is going to be zinc phosphide. Um, and so zinc phosphide here uh, are these little pellets. So we're going to put those into our stomach here. And what that does when it mixes with your stomach contents is it releases something called phosphine gas or pH 3. And now this phosphine gas, once released, can get absorbed. And when that gas gets absorbed, it can go and can affect your ability to uh, generate and utilize ATP. And so tissues, as you can imagine, don't like that. We sort of just touched on that a little while ago with the bromethylene. And so tissues that require high oxygen demand or high ATP using cells are going to get um, you know, uh, progressive necrosis and uh, dysfunction of those organs. So any of your high energy um, using organs like brain, liver, lungs, kidneys are all going to take a pretty significant hit, uh, hit with zinc, uh, zinc phosphide. So, uh, so it is a pretty diffuse effect. Um, to treat it, uh, there are some uh, general things like vomiting. You might see abdominal distension, uh, tremor seizures, dyspnea, tachycardia, uh, tachycardia in severe cases. And then diagnosing it, again, university or specialty labs uh, to make it definitive. Um, but again, you either have to know or you might be able to smell the phosphine gas in the stomach contents. And people describe it as smelling something like garlic or rotten fish, um, as much as you probably don't want to have to smell stomach contents and doubly don't want to have to smell st stomach contents that smell like rotten fish. Uh, it is kind of the main way that people recommend to do it. Um, treatment, uh, MSS, um, gastric uh, lavage, even if they are mentally appropriate, is recommended because if you can uh, mix that with a 5% uh, sodium bicarb solution, you can decrease the ability of the phosphide gas to be liberated, so you can reduce gas production. Uh, get these patients on some IV fluids and get them on some liver protectants. Uh, prognosis varies if you treat them early and it's not a huge um, time since they got treated. Generally, prognosis is pretty good. High doses, late presentation, not as good. All right, next we're going to talk about plants. Um, so first we'll talk about mushrooms. So specifically, we're going to talk about amatoxin containing mushrooms. Uh, there is a toxic dose here. Again, it's pretty hard to know if they get this dose, so not very helpful. Uh, these mushrooms do retain toxicity regardless if they're cooked, frozen, dried. So it doesn't matter if they ate it, it's been tox uh, intoxicated. Um, it is very rapidly absorbed. It doesn't need uh, binding to protein, so it's distributed everywhere very quickly, uh, especially to the liver and kidneys, which don't like it. Um, and it reduces protein synthesis and reduces apoptosis or cell death in these tissues. Uh, so the big question everyone always asks is, how do you know if it's an am amatoxin-containing mushroom? And so there's a few identifying things that you can look at if you actually have the mushroom to look at. And so they do have what's called smooth, moist caps that peel easily when you rub them with your finger, generally about 6 to 12 centimeters in diameter, and these yellow to dark green um, uh, striations that, that kind of streak out from it. Um, in addition to that, you can also see this big sort of irregular ring that's up at the near of the top of the, the stem. Um, so that's a common trait of, of the amatoxin mushrooms. And then you can also see that their gills don't connect to the main stem. Um, and so you'll see that there's a nice little ring there of the gills not being connected. And then if you are really gung-ho, you can smell it. Uh, and people say there is a little bit of a sweet odor to it. Um, and then last, uh, there are these sort of bulbous cups at the base of the stalks that it, generally don't see that because a lot of times it breaks off when people bring it in, but you, you may or may not see that. Uh, there's three phases to the clinical signs. The first is a GI phase. Uh, vomiting and diarrhea really is the big thing that you see with that. Um, tachycardia, hypoglycemia, electrolyte derangements, as you've had, a lot of vomiting and diarrhea will develop. You then get a latent phase where they seem like they get better and they seem fine, but unbeknownst to you, you have um, hepatic and renal uh, progression happening. And then after that 24 to 72 hours is when you progress to the hepatorenal stage, which is when you get the progressive uh, liver and uh, kidney dysfunction with um, liver dysfunction really being the main one and all the sequela that come with it. 
Um, to diagnose it, uh, it is detectable for a little while in blood and a little bit longer in urine. Again, you got to send it out to a special lab uh, for mass spec or chromatography. You can send out the vomit. You can send out a lavage fluid, um, stool they can detect it in. Um, again, it's not going to be a fast turnaround time for these. Uh, there is this thing called the Mixner test if you're feeling ambitious. Um, you essentially can ask, either mix uh, the mushroom fragments in with methanol, and you can ma order methanol from most uh, supply places that you are to get your hospital supplies from, um, and you incubate it for 48 hours. Uh, meanwhile, if you just have stomach contents, you can st skip this step. Um, you then place either a dot of your methanol solution or a dot of stomach contents on plain newspaper. So this is literally just generic newspaper that you would get uh, thrown on your front doorstep. Put a, a controlled dot of water or whatever you want to use as a control, then a, a dot of your methanol solution or your stomach contents, and then add a drop of 12N. Uh, 12 uh, stands for normality, uh, but essentially this is 38% hydrochloric acid. Again, you can order this from most uh, supply companies. Um, this is very strong. Uh, do not inhale it and don't get it on your skin. Um, so I recommend doing it outside if you're going to do this. But what you do is you put a couple drops of that. And if amatoxins are present, it turns blue. And so this is a positive amatoxin test here where that uh, result turned blue. And you got your negative control here to show that there was no color change. So if you can happen to have these in supply in your hospital, you can do at the time of presentation uh, diagnosis. But again, it is dependent on if you want to have to deal with this. Uh, treatment, vomiting, gastric lavage, you know, all of that, activated charcoal, liver protectants, very important. I recommend N acetylcysteine if you can. Um, it would be much more ideal than something oral. IV fluid diuresis, the duration of which will be determined by how they are doing with all of their sequela of their toxicities. Uh, possible fresh frozen plasma transfusions if they're hypocoagulable. Um, sometimes liver uh, uh, ventilation if they've got really bad liver failure. Uh, liver transplants, which we really don't do in animals, but uh, this actually does happen in humans. Um, and so a lot of humans that are intoxicated have to get liver transplants. Uh, generally carries a very poor prognosis if they start becoming symptomatic, so it's really not great. Um, depends on that degree of hepatic dysfunction and how young they are, so how well can their liver regenerate, um, but it's generally not uh, fantastic. Uh, cannabis is another one. This is getting super common with the rise of cannabis use. Uh, main toxic component is going to be the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. Um, I don't really like calling it a toxin because it's very unlikely that any pet is going to die from this, but it does cause unwanted clinical signs. So we consider it a toxin. Um, it can be consumed in a lot of forms. Uh, cannabis does have to be heated for THC to become active. So if they eat, just eat raw plant, they generally will not become high from that. It needs to be some sort of an oil formulation or something that's been heated um, to create that uh, that active form. Um, synthetic forms are also very toxic and potent because um, they are pretty much already in the toxic form. Um, and then clinical signs, um, your big ones are going to be ataxia, mentation change, dribbling urine, and the hyperesthesia, so kind of hyperreactivity to stimuli. Um, they'll be tremoring as well, and we'll sometimes see hypothermia. Um, Bradycardia is another one you can sometimes see, um, but a lot of times you'll see these combination of things and you can pretty much diagnose them as they walk in the door. Uh, to officially diagnose it, there's your university labs, or you can try one of the over-the-counter human drug tests. Debatable accuracy, we don't think dogs um, metabolize it exactly the same as we do, so it may or may not work. Um, to treat it, if you uh, think it's still worth it, uh, vomiting and charcoal, um, just basic supportive care, anxiolytic sedation if needed, fluids. Um, if they're really severe, it is lipid soluble, um, so you can give a dose of intralipid if you want. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to sleeping it off and giving them time. Um, it's very uncommon that this will be um, fatal, uh, so generally these dogs just need time um, and they will be much better. Um, prognosis is generally excellent, um, so that's good. Uh, we're going to try to hammer out lilies real quick. Um, so lilies, uh, there is no known toxic component. All parts of the plant are toxic. Um, and we don't know if there is a toxic dose, but we do not believe it, it is very high. Small doses are probably toxic. Um, it causes really significant renal damage. And so we will see clinical signs consistent with that, uh, lethargy, vomiting, and impotence. And then also acute renal failure can develop as soon as 24 hours after ingestion. It is not easy to diagnose because there are no tests available. You can't even use a university or a diagnostic lab because we don't know what the toxic component is, so we can't even test for it at all. Uh, we just have to look for the azotemia or the electrolyte derangements that develop because of the azotemia, or even worse, if we start seeing proteinuria or isostenuria. Um, the only saving grace is that most cats tend to tell us that they got into the lilies because they turned themselves all yellow. Um, so all of these cats should definitely be getting treatment because they've all very clearly been significantly exposed. 
Um, so there are a lot of common lilies that you will see that are the toxic ones. There are some quote unquote lilies that are considered non-toxic, so calla and peace being the big ones. Here are some pictures of what those look like. Um, if pets eat these lilies, they do contain oxalate crystals in the flowers, which cause really bad um, oral and GI irritation. So it's still not great if they're doing it, but they will not have uh, kidney failure if it happens. Um, to treat it, vomiting, charcoal, same stuff as we've been talking. Uh, aggressive IV fluids, and this should, again, kind of like I talked about earlier, um, you know, uh, 48 to 72 hours is always ideal, a little bit longer with these ones. Um, and then making sure that if you are doing a really high rate of IV fluids, uh, making sure you wean these patients down slowly. A lot of people forget about this. Um, when you give a high rate of IV fluids, you flush all of the normal electrolytes out of the kidneys. So the kidneys have really high sodium, urea, potassium concentration gradients, and that's what filters the urine that goes through your kidneys that it's supposed to be there. But when you give really high rates of IV fluids, you flush those gradients out, and that's called medullary washout. And so if you abruptly stop IV fluids, there's you you have it you've now created a problem and these patients are going to now get further and more severe electrolyte derangements and so if you wean them down slowly um, you can help replenish and re reduce that medullary wash up before you stop them so the higher rate of fluids you have them on the longer you should wean them down off of them for um, these patients should have the renal values monitored every 24 hours including one to two days after they are discharged from the hospital and this will be longer if they developed an azotemia um, and then um, don't know what that was supposed to say right there, but um, I think that was supposed to say dialysis because if they are getting persistent or worsening azotemia, that's where they're headed is uh, die for dialysis. Um, prognosis is guarded uh, is generally good, but it's guarded for the patients that are um, having that persistent or worsening azotemia. Uh, there are some toxic plant resources if you have a type of lily that you're not sure about. I put some good ones here that will help you figure out if you have a toxic lily. Uh, with that, I'm going to move into medications. I will keep talking until I, I get through the end of this list. Uh, for those that only had an hour, you know, by all means, feel, <clears throat> feel free to drop off. Um, but for those that uh, would like to uh, finish hearing these out, I will I will keep going. So uh, feel free to stay on, and, and I will finish these out. Uh, for those that have to drop off, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, I uh, think there's probably a way that we can find an email address uh, for me to, to get to you guys, or I can, we can find a way to send that to you. Um, so feel, by all means, feel free to reach out to me by email anytime. I, I'm totally fine for you to reach out with any questions that you have. Um, sorry, so for, for those that are going to uh, stay on, we'll start with our medications. And so we're going to first talk about our uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or our NSAIDs. Um, so there are a whole bunch of these. Um, I, I wrote down pretty much all of them here, toxic doses that I won't go you know, one by one for each of them. Uh, just take note that these are doses in dogs. Um, cats can't uh, do glucuronidation um, as well as dogs can, and that's really important for breaking down these drugs. Uh, so their toxic dose is much less, sometimes half, if even even more than half of these, um, because they take so much longer to eliminate them out of their bodies. Um, clinical signs associated with NSAID toxicity is, is a lot of it's going to be GI because um, we will see uh, ulcer formation with these, so vomiting and hematemesis, um, anorexia. We can start seeing renal damage with our NSAIDs, um, so PUPD, kind of vague uh, renal failure signs, glethor G. Some dogs you can see in idiosyncratic, so just like the greats, Grapes, idiosyncratic means it happens in some, not in others. So we don't know when this is going to happen. It's unpredictable. But some dogs, you will see it in their liver. And so you might see signs of liver failure or like this serum here that looks nice and icteric. Um, and then really high doses of NSAIDs, you'll start seeing CNS uh, effects. So mentation changes, ataxia and seizures. And then I just have a picture here of some nice um, kind of erosions in your stomach and then some really severe ulcers uh, to go along with that. Uh, treatment, vomiting, charcoal, fluid diuresis, you know, again, longer is always better. Uh, GI protection is really important. So for ulcer present, uh, prevention, mesoprostol is really your, your best one to use. Uh, dose here, three micrograms per kilogram, Q8 for three days. Um, always make sure you tell clients if they are pregnant or trying to become pregnant, they should not touch it. Uh, mesoprostol is what is used to induce labor uh, when uh, that's needed to be done. So uh, we don't need to be inducing labor into in, in, anyone that doesn't need it. Um, antacids, if there's ulcers, to try to re, um, reduce the acidity of that stomach to let those acids heal a little bit easier. Um, omeprazole and pantoprazole are going to be your two, uh, one mg per kg. Uh, I like to do Q12. Some people used to do Q24, but <clears throat> some studies have suggested Q12 is a little bit better, um, so that's what I go with. Um, and then famotidine, if you ha if you if you can't find omeprazole um, or pantoprazole, but but really these work much better than famotidine, so if you can go with those. Um, Anti-megs, if they need it, Serenia or Antacitron. And then ulcer protection, so sucralfate to cover over those ulcers to help keep them protected. 
Um, if it's acute stages of intoxication, you can consider lipid therapy. Um, again, look up the um, log P of those and see if it's appropriate. And then watch those renal values every 24 hours, um, however long uh, you feel is appropriate, depending on if any elevations develop. Uh, in terms of acetaminophen um, or Tylenol, um, I do know that this is different here in the UK, uh, which I believe is uh, paracetamol. I, someone could correct me if I am wrong, um, but it essentially is the same um, thing and the same toxicity. Um, so there are toxic doses uh, published at, uh, published here. Uh, toxic effect is that it does cause a pattern of cellular necrosis, so you can get some pretty bad liver damage with it. And then it can also do Heinz body formation, kind of like how we talked about before with uh, the grapes and onions. And so you can see met hemoglobinemia and anemia with that. Um, so clinical signs um, are pretty much all over the place, depending on which of these toxic effects um, you're starting to see. Diagnosis, uh, again, uh, confirmatory testing. Uh, to university or specialty labs takes a long time, but we need to check PT-PTT to make sure there's no significant liver damage and um, hypocoagulabilities, ALT and t to look for liver damage, and then watching for Heinz body and methemoglobinemia. Treatment, vomiting charcoal, liver protectants, fluids, all of our obvious stuff, uh, fresh rose and plasma if they're coagulopathic, and uh, red blood cells if they're anemic, possibly vitamin K if they're coagulopathic. This methylene blue is that thing I talked about earlier. Uh, it's very intense blue. It looks like ink dye. Um, when you're injecting into a patient, it feels very wrong. Um, this is the treatment that you would give for methemoglobinemia. It helps to remove um, the oxidation on the uh, hemoglobin so it can become oxygen carrying again. Um, again, this is not really one of those things you give commonly. Those patients need to be symptomatic for their hypoxia um, or be symptomatic with signs of hypoxia for this to make sense to give. Um, and then, of course, monitoring liver values and coags on these patients uh, to know what other treatments they're going to need. Um, next, we will move into our antidepressants, anxiolytics, and stimulants. And as you can see, there are a ton. And this also isn't even a um, comprehensive list, so there's even more. Um, the good news is they all tend to do roughly the same thing or at least um, have the same toxic um, um, causes or uh, toxicity signs, and so we can sum them all in the same uh, slides. And so I'll first give uh, an explanation of how um, normal nerve conduction um, happens, and specifically <clears throat> nerve conduction that's uh, mediated by serotonin. And so this is going to be when people talk about depression or anxiety issues, serotonin is a big factor that plays into that. And so here we have one nerve cell going into another nerve cell with a synaptic cleft in between them. And so nerve cells are going to be going from the top nerve into the bottom nerve. And so the normal way this should work is that you have L-tryptophan, a very basic amino acid um, that is in these cells. And what happens is that tryptophan gets converted into these little vesicles that contain serotonin or 5-HT serotonin. Um, and then when you have a nerve signal that comes down into the cell, that triggers these vesicles to go into the end of that nerve and then to release their contents into the synaptic cleft. And those contents will bind to this thing over here called a 5-HT1A receptor. And so those contents will get released. You'll get that binding there. And then you have an action potential that gets generated and continues on through the next nerve cell. Now that's not where it ends because what you have to do is you have to get all of this um, serotonin out of the synaptic cleft. And so there's this thing called a monoamine transporter that's gonna suck it all back up into your cell, followed by which there is now a monoamine oxidase, um, which is there to now break down all that serotonin, recycle it and reuse it. Now, when you have your antidepressants, anxiolytics and all those drugs, you have different groups and they're going to do different things that all ultimately have the same end result. So your first two groups here, your serotonin reuptake inhibitors and your tricyclic antidepressants, those are going to all um, go over here to your monoamine transporters and will not allow your serotonin to be taken back up into the nerve cell. Your monoamine oxidase inhibitors are going to do exactly what the name implies and inhibit monoamine oxidase, that, which means that when our serotonin gets uh, taken back in, we can't break it down and reuse it. It's staying sort of circulating and kind of going back and forth in between the synaptic cleft and it isn't um, getting recycled. Um, OTC or over-the-counter products, these are basically going to be uh, tryptophan supplements. And then of course, all of our amphetamines, which are mostly illegal drugs, are going to come over here and promote increased um, 
vesicle and um, binding and release of serotonin into the synaptic cleft. And basically what all of these things are doing is they are increasing the amount of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. And when that gets um, to be severe, that is what we call serotonin syndrome. And that's when we start seeing the toxic effects. Now, in terms of clinical signs, hyperactivity and restlessness tremors tend to be the most common things you'll see. Hyperthermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, madriasis, that, those all kind of come secondary to that. Really severe cases, you'll start seeing the seizures. Um, diagnosis, um, again, it, it's, it's the same as we've been talking about, specialty labs, long turnaround time. There are some over-the-counter tests that will test for some of the amphetamine drugs, but just like the cannabis, it's, it's questionable accuracy. It, it really depends if it's helpful or not, so a lot of times people just don't do it. To treat it, get the drug out of them if you can. I like to do gastric lavage for these because a lot of these patients aren't in a good mental state to induce MSS, so I will do gastric lavage if it's in the acute stages of ingestion. Um, repeated doses of activated charcoal because this is one that has enterohepatic recirculation. Um, these dogs will be agitated, so ACE promazine for sedation. Um, tor or butofenol would probably be better if it is a heart patient. Um, propranolol uh, for those tachycardias like we talked about with chocolate. Um, if it's progressing into ventricular tachycardia, you might have to think, think about lidocaine, um, but propranolol is usually sufficient. If they have really bad muscle tremors, <clears throat> methocarbamol would be your treatment for that. And then if they have seizures, acute seizures, Valium, um, but then get them on phenobarbital because there's likely going to be more seizures. And now ciproheptatine is a serotonin antagonist. So this is a really good one to get into them. If you can get into them rectally and they're mentally appropriate to do that, then do that. If you can't give it rectally, it does have rectal absorption. Um, so do that and give it every six hours. Um, it's pretty easy to get over the, <clears throat> over the counter from most pharmacies if you don't stock it. Um, so if um, you get one of these patients, give the owner a script, tell them to run to the pharmacy and get it and bring it back to the hospital to get it started. Uh, vitamin D toxicity. So cholecalciferol, we already kind of talked about this one a little bit, so I'll, I'll plow through this one real quick. But we can see it in vitamin supplements. We can see it in certain body creams. Um, like I said, it's the same as cholecalciferol. We in, um, increase calcium absorption. We get some really bad uh, kidney effects. Treatments like we talked about, get it out of them. Um, calci, urease them with uh, furosemide and prednisone. Um, and then you can also um, see really high phosphate um, elevations. I, we didn't mention this in the other slide, but if you get really bad um, phosphorus elevations, you can give them aluminum hydroxide to get that phosphorus down and then monitor all of the obvious values that you should be monitoring to make sure that uh, we're seeing this and that this will be at least for you know three to four days or longer if they develop elevations in that time. Um, albuterol is another one. Um, we don't tend to see necessarily people giving their dogs or cats too many pops of albuterol. It tends to be more so the dogs that pick up an inhaler and puncture it. And even if it looks like the contents, you know, tooth puncture and it all blew out of their mouth, they usually still get enough um, gingival absorption that they still will see toxic effects. So even if the owner doesn't think it all absorbed, that, that jet stream shot you know, didn't shoot into their mouth, they can still see the toxic effects. So they still need to come in for treatment. Um, but what albuterol does is it binds um, beta-2 receptors and it uh, promotes them or essentially it makes them um, act, uh, it, it increases their effect. And so your sodium potassium ATAs pump is mediated by these beta-2 receptors. So you'll see an increased activity in these sodium potassium ATPase pumps. And if you remember when we talked about that before with bromethylin, that brings a lot of potassium into the cells. So we induce a hypokalemia because all of the potassium that was in our blood is now in our cells. And you might think, well, total body potassium is the same. We didn't take any potassium out of the body. We didn't put any more potassium in. So total potassium is the same, but that's not what's important. The potassium has been all moved into the cells and systemically in the blood it's reduced. And that's where it's important because we need it to not just be in the cell, we need it to be both places. Um, and so that's where that's a problem is we induce a really significant hypokalemia um, and in addition to that, there's also other act, um, effects of beta receptors getting activated on the heart. It's going to cause tachycardia. And then on the actual smooth muscle of your blood vessel cells, you're going to get vasodilation and therefore hypotension. So with this, you'll see these dogs get really agitated and hyperactive because they're very tachycardic. Um, you might see arrhythmias, mostly sinus tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. Weakness or collapse if they get really hypokalemic or bad arrhythmias, uh, tachypnea, tremors, and hyperthermia. Hyperthermia because of the tremors usually. Um, this is obviously just a tachycardic ECG at the bottom. Um, so with albuterol diagnosis, there's not really any specific test to do this. I, I, I suspect a university or specialty hospital could um, diagnose it, but I, I just don't think it's very common for that to be tested, so they probably don't. Um, hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia is the big thing to watch for in these guys, and then sinus tachycardia on ECG. 
And so to treat them, IV fluids with uh, potassium supplementation, which is usually potassium chloride or KCL. Um, if they are low in phosphorus, you can also add in potassium phosphate. Um, so you could do both of them at the same time. Just take note that they both contain potassium. It is super common that we give them both at the same time because the potassium in KFOS is really low and it's not very helpful. So you will generally need to give KCL as well. Now, the thing is, some of these dogs are so significantly hypokalemic that you have to give them a ton of potassium. The limit is 0.5 milliequivalents per kg per hour. That's the safe amount, because if you give more than that, we start inducing severe bradycardia. But in some of these dogs, that's not even enough, and you have to go over Kmax to get them treated. And that's fine, as long as you're monitoring their ECG really quick, uh, really closely, because if they're still tachycardic, clearly we're not inducing a life-threatening bradycardia, so we can go higher on that potassium supplementation. But if you're going higher than 0.5 milliequivalents per kg per hour, get them on an ECG and then go up. And so now the reason I talk about the important thing to know about there being potassium in both of these fluids is because it's probably likely you're going to have to get both of them together. And it's very clearly noted on the front of the bottle what the potassium amount is um, in uh, obviously KCL, but also in um, potassium phosphates is right here, 4.4 uh, millimoles per mil. And so when you're trying to figure out what your Kmax is and what's a safe amount to give to your dog, which is that 0.5 mils, milliequivalents per kg per hour, make sure you're adding your potassium amount for your KCL and your potassium amount from this to make sure you're not overdosing them and you know what you're doing. Um, for Panelol, we've kind of talked about this already. Like I said, 170 to 180 tends to be my trigger pull to give that. Um, diazepam or midazolam for agitation. And then um, we've already talked about uh, the supplementation of potassium and phosphorus, but then making sure you monitor it so you know when to uh, stop supplementation. All right, uh, we just have a couple more to get through and we will be all set. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is going to be topical flea and tick um, products, which is going to specifically be pyrethrins, which we touched about a little bit before when we were talking about intralipid therapy. Um, I do recognize that these are mostly uh, US brands. I apologize, I don't know the uh, UK brands very well, but um, when I talk about over-the-counter um, non-prescription flea and tick products, I suspect most of you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so the toxic effect with this is going to be specifically in cats, um, and that's because dogs don't have this toxic effect with pyrethrins or um, permethrins, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, but they do have it in cats. And so what happens is you get a delayed opening and closing of sodium channels in, um, in their peripheral muscle cells. It's also in their salivary glands and in their, in their CNS, um, but your peripheral muscle cells be, tend to be the most common place that's affected. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to cause hyperactivity of these nerve cells. So you're going to get um, uh, generally uh, really bad tremors or spasticity of those uh, muscles. And because you also have high levels of sodium channels in your salivary glands, you'll also tend to see a lot of salivation, uh, salivation from these, uh, these pets. Um, so this is going to be also an unfortunate um, throwback to uh, physiology that not probably many people are going to want to listen to, um, but I'm going to just do it real quick because it will make this make a little bit more sense. And so this is going to be showing us an action potential that's going to go through one of our uh, muscle cells. And so this is where uh, we essentially have our resting membrane potential, and then we have this first uh, peak right here, which is going to be where we get opening of sodium channels, and we get a bunch of sodium that rushes into the cell, and that increases the voltage, and that's what causes our action potential to shoot off like this um, and go off. And then at the top of this peak is going to be where our sodium channels now close, and all that sodium is going to get pushed out of the cell. We're going to bring our voltage back down, reset, and get ready for the next uh, action potential or the next um, flexion of that nerve and muscle cell. And so what happens when you have your pyrethrins in there is we have delayed opening and closing of those sodium and potassium channels. And so what should normally happen is just like this, that muscle um, gets bigger when we go up and smaller when we go down. This is obviously a very gross exaggeration of this, but for explanation purposes, this will, uh, this will suffice. Um, but essentially what will happen is as you have pyrethrins in, you now are delaying opening of these and you're delaying closing of this. So you tend to fluctuate back and forth in this um, mid voltage state here, trying to fire off action potential after action potential, and you get muscle spasticity and really bad tremors from it. And that's why we tend to see those cats come in with really severe muscle tremors. And because this also happens in the CNS at high doses, you'll start seeing the mentation changes as well. So clinical signs I've talked about, the salivation, the tremors, ataxia and weakness that obviously would come with this. Um, when uh, you get the really uh, high doses, you'll see the seizures. And then um, because of the muscle tremors, 
if they're really severe, you might start seeing some difficulty breathing, or you might actually get muscle damage and start seeing myoglobinuria. Um, diagnosis, uh, common theme, uh, university lab, um, but it's hard to measure. Um, but uh, generally, there's not a really good way to diagnose it. So you just have to look at lab work um, and the sequela of the intoxication and, uh, and use that as your go-to. Uh, to treat it, if they ate it, which is not the usual way that most of these um, cats get um, intoxicated, induce vomiting and charcoal, uh, and irrigate their mouth. But more commonly, it was applied topical. So for those cats, shave the hair off of the infected area and wash with a uh, good dish soap. Um, if they're hyperthermic from the tremoring, cool them down. Uh, never cool a cat to anything less than like 102. Uh, once you get to 102, if they're wet, um, start drying them off. If, they're, if they have a fan on them, take the fan off because um, they will continue to drop. Um, so 102 is my ult is my absolute bottom that I will stop. Typically, I will stop at 103.5, um, but somewhere between 102 and 103.5 is, is where you should stop. Um, fluids, because these cats tend to be losing a lot of fluid and, and might not be taking it in. Uh, methocarbamol is going to be your go-to uh, for tremor control, um, 50 mg per kg, uh, kind of Q8 or as needed, uh, phenobar for seizures at high doses, and then big time intralipid therapy. This is when you should definitely do that for. Uh, I believe this is our last one. It's going to be ethylene glycol. Um, so big source of this is antifreeze, but they do put it in a lot of other things. Sometimes you see it spilled in the street um, and it's not cleaned up. And this is actually one of the more common ways that dogs and cats get exposed <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and so the hard thing with ethylene glycol is that it is very sweet and that's what makes them want to eat it. Uh, and that's how they get intoxicated. They don't need a lot, uh, small dose in dogs, even smaller in cats. Uh, essentially what happens is that ethylene glycol is completely non-toxic, um, but what happens is that the liver converts it to oxalic acid, which now is toxic. Um, that happens very quickly. So it is a quick onset of intoxication. <clears throat> and what this oxalic acid does, it wants to turn into a um, more mineralized form or crystallized form, which means it's going to bind with calcium to do that, and it's going to form calcium oxalate crystals. And this does start happening as soon as 24 hours, sometimes even less, and will continue 48 hours or even longer. And all of these calcium oxalate crystals are going to deposit in the kidneys. As you can imagine, the kidneys don't like that, uh, and you're going to start getting uh, kidney damage and ultimately uh, kidney failure. Um, clinical signs comes in three stages. Stage one, they just look drunk. It looks like they ingested a bunch of alcohol. Um, so vomiting, kind of PUPD, CNS depression, ataxia, things that you'd expect. Uh, but then just like those amatoxin mushrooms, you go through this period where they seem to go back to normal. Um, but, you know, low unbeknownst to you, you've got um, ongoing kidney damage that's happening, just hasn't shown its face yet. Sometimes in cats, you'll see some uh, tachypnea and tachycardia that, that presents um, in that stage two, but I, I don't tend to see that very often. Um, stage three is where it becomes a problem, though, and stage three does tend to come pretty soon. I mean, it's as early as 12 hours in cats, so they progress through these stages pretty darn fast. Um, but this is your oliguric renal failure or even worse, aneuric renal failure, and it comes with all the horrible signs that come with that. Um, generally, when you get to the stage, it's not good um, because that damage that's happened is permanent, and it's kind of hard to slow it down once it's started. Um, so this is, this is usually a, a fairly poor prognosis. Um, diagnosis, early diagnosis and, and starting treatment is totally and absolutely key, um, so as fast as we can. Um, if you aren't able to actually measure and try to detect the ethylene glycol, you can try to measure what's called the osmolal gap. Um, some people in their hospitals have um, acid-based machines that can measure osmolal gap, and what that is is our measured osmolarity. And typically, we also have our unmeasured osmolarity, which are things that the machines can't read. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what we know is used to measure the osmolarity, which are going to be sodium, potassium, BUN, and glucose using this equation. So if you had a you know, blood work you did, you, you now know what the calculated osmolarity is, and we know what the measured osmolarity is. However, we now can figure out what the difference between those is, which is our osmol gap, and that's going to be our unmeasured osmols, which are going to be things um, like albumin is technically an unmeasured osmol, but more importantly, it's going to be ethylene glycol is an unmeasured osmol. And so normally, you only you have a difference of like less than 10 or so between your measured and unmeasured osmolality, or you have, you know, therefore a less than 10 osmolal gap. And if it's higher than that, <clears throat> that is concerning for a dog that, uh, or cat that ingested ethylene glycol. Um, because oxalic acid, again, it is an acid, you will see a metabolic acidosis with these uh, patients and um, azotemia, hyperphosphatemia, and electrate derangements because of the um, kidney damage. 
Um, diagnosis, uh, I think the one thing that probably sticks in most people's minds is the calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals, the little kind of elongated houses, or you know, some people call them like the barn-shaped um, crystals that you can see. Um, it happens pretty quickly, and they do tend to go away pretty quickly, but they, the crystals can stick around for a little bit longer, so you should always check. Um, and then you can also measure um, the peak, uh, the, the levels of ethylene glycol in their blood, or it's, I think you can also measure their constituents as well, which will be a university lab, or they make these little uh, dipsticks that, that a lot of hospitals tend to carry um, that you can uh, dip their uh, serum for and uh, try to detect it. And then in terms of treatment, uh, vomiting, lavage, charcoal, um, fluids, and uh, GI protectants. Uh, phosphate binders if you start getting um, really bad hyperphosphatemia along with your azotemia, and then monitoring your, inpo in, uh, your output very closely. Again, you can do it visually, um, but if it's visually looking like it's not that much, get a urinary catheter in and look for oliguria and anuria. If one of these develop, it's not a great prognosis, um, so just prep the owners for that. Generally, these guys are the ones that are needing to go for hemodialysis. Note, if you think they got a really high dose and you're not sure where they are at in treatment, skip all of this stuff or maybe at least do the early uh, decontamination things and just immediately right away refer them somewhere for hemodialysis. Because if it's anything more than a few hours, we may have already missed the window for this and we just need to get them somewhere with hemodialysis because this is going to be really that patient's only chance at, uh, at getting through this. So just make that uh, referral as, as soon as you can. Uh, treatment continued if it's early in your summer you maybe you can't refer early or you don't have very many options you can treat these dogs with ethanol and so literally this is just uh, you know uh, 20 percent or 30 percent so some sort of low grade alcohol um, that you can just get at the store doses here that you can give for that um, there are actual um, ethanols that um, are safe for iv formulation so you can actually get some of these for iv um, it's not very common that you will find these and they're not very easy to find so it's unlikely that many of you will have it but there is a dose and here it is and then lastly there's this thing called fomipazole this is if a patient goes into anuric or oliguric renal failure um, this vasodilates the blood vessels to the kidneys to try to get more blood flow going through them to improve kidney function um, generally when you're at this point um, um, you're generally not in a great position anyways um, but um, uh, but it's still worth it um, I'm at, sorry I'm mixing up two things this is for, from Epizole, I'm, I'm saying this a little bit backwards from is actually a binder uh, for uh, for your ethylene glycol so this actually will help bind it if you have it sorry I'm going to confuse you a little bit from is for um, uh, is for the binding of your ethylene glycol to to get it removed out of the body faster. I have doses here. Uh, what I was referring to before um, is uh, a different medication um, that starts with an F whose name is uh, escaping me at the moment, which is why I mixed it up with Fomipazole, which is a, a vasodilator to the kidneys, um, which generally, if you're at that stage, I would expect that patient to have been referred somewhere else anyways. Um, and if they're getting to the point where you're having to do a renal vasodilator, the, the prognosis is pretty poor, and it's pretty common that we get there. So um, know that that's a possibility, but, but don't concern yourself too, too much with that. Um, so with that, that was the, the end of this presentation. Um, I don't know, think, I think people can unmute and, and ask questions or um, I'll stop sharing my screen because I, I can't see comments right now. But if anyone wants to ask any comments, I will open up the, the, the chat function if you want to chat on there and not uh, ask verbally. Um, but feel free to, to ask away. I'll, I'll hang out as long as people want. And if uh, you're all good, feel free to drop off. Um, but I'll just say thank you right now, everyone, for, for joining. Um, I'm going to put my email right now in the chat function so people can email me if they want. Sorry, typing and talking at the same time is not my forte. Okay, email is there if anyone wants it. Um, but um, but yeah, feel free to drop off if you're good. Uh, thanks everyone and let me know if you have any questions.